Uh, so I'm Kenzie Lodi. I am the, let's see, my job title at the moment is the Operations Manager at CIFAR, the Center for Applied Rationality. Um, and I'm 24 years old. I have a bachelor's degree in biology and also a bachelor's degree in drama. Um, the way I got here is because I used to be a professional stage manager. Uh, that's what I got my first degree in. And so I did a lot of logistics and coordinating and communicating and um, running meetings and making sure everyone had the correct information at the correct time, making sure objects show up in the right place. And when I first met Anna at the May CIFAR mini camp, uh, I was a participant there and I was explaining to her all of this. She said, wow, CIFAR could really use like someone who has that skill set. Uh, do you want to work for CIFAR? I was like, oh, um, sure. But at the time I lived in Oregon and so we, we worked out a way that I was sort of doing this stuff long distance, which is actually really hard. I had never done that before. But so I was doing long distance coordination. I flew down for the mini camps this summer. And then when I finished my commitments there in September, I moved down here. And since then I've been doing just CIFAR. Let's see. So <clears throat> this is actually, it's, I am, um, I've had a lot of, I've spent a lot of time for many years working on trying to figure out what my emotions were doing, why I felt the way I did about some things, and trying to get my emotions on board with what I wanted to have happen. Um, <clears throat> so for example, so this is a like funny, weird personal story, but like I, there's a lot of guys, nerdy, like smart, rationalist guys in this community, uh, and I have conversations with them and lots of guys have these stories about their like crazy ex-girlfriend who would, you know, do this weird thing or like get really upset about this other thing. And um, it's always, you know, it's like frustrating to hear about my friends having had these like frustrating relationships and not being able to have good communication or like reasonable interpersonal interactions, but usually the person that I like identify with in this story is the crazy ex-girlfriend um, because like I grew up having a lot of like weird emotional thought processes, um, weird emotional miscalibrations, uh, but from for many years now I've been working on that. I've been trying to like make my own mind make sense to me, figure out what's like running under the hood and then how to alter it so that it is better. Um, and so that I can be a better person and better interact with other people and be happier. So that's the side of things that really, um, when I first encountered sort of the sequences on less wrong and rationality and then later CIFAR, that's what has really drawn me in because it's so tied into what I've been working on for most of my adult life, for myself personally. And <clears throat> it seems like you know, I've been sort of like shooting in the dark. I had like no idea that there was like actually people who were working on this and doing, you know, studies and looking at large group sizes. So it feels like rationality and CIFAR in this community is just a way for me to like rapidly import solutions that other people have found um, and to like level myself up much faster. And that's why I first got interested in it. So when I read the sequence, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, can, is like ways for me to think better about all these different things. The funny thing about drama is that I think that it's actually a really good way for people to um, gain sort of general purp purpose, uh, like ability to get things done. We talk about some of the sort of getting shit done quality here sometimes, and I think that theater trains that actually really well in people. There's uh, Stephen Cole, our exec assistant, has theater background. Jonathan Pollard, one of our volunteers, has theater background. It, a lot of people come out of that with the ability to like complete projects. Um, so I think it's really useful. I uh, don't regret the time that I worked in theater. I regret majoring in theater. <laughs> like that was a mistake. It was a bad idea. I uh, shouldn't have done it. But working in theater, I don't regret it at all. Center for... Center for Applied Rationality, um, and we are a nonprofit organization that takes a lot of what science has figured out about human cognition and human psychology in the last 40 or 50 years, and I say the last 40 or 50 years because that's like 
how long people have really been like trying to figure out how humans actually make decisions. Um, it's one of the funny things about science where there's these like really obviously important questions and no one thinks to answer them. Um, but so we have this sort of set of literature that tells us about how humans actually think and the answer to like what the literature has discovered is that humans are just like glitchy, you know, like we have these brains, right? Okay, so here's a picture of a brain and they're just like terrible clued. It's like, oh, you know, we have two halves, but like, let's make this thing in the middle of it so that we can talk to each other, right? And, uh, you know, this thing is like, this amygdala, like, used to be really useful, but now is like totally not adaptive, but you know, instead of getting rid of it, we'll just like override it with the frontal cortex. Um, so human brains are just kind of suck in a lot of ways, which, I mean, you have to temper that with the fact that it's amazing that they even exist in the first place. Um, and that is something that like should never be underestimated is how cool is that. But nonetheless, they kind of suck. And uh, it turns out there's a bunch of specific ways in which most people, we have this like shared set of flaws in the way we think. And the problem, one of the flaws is that knowing about the flaws doesn't fix them. Um, so, for example, it turns out that if you ask a bunch of people how much they'd be willing to do, pay to save a thousand birds from drowning in oil spills versus 10,000 birds versus 100,000 birds, the answer is essentially the same. Same amount of money to save 100,000 birds is to save a thousand birds. And that seems bad. That's unfortunate. It would be better if we were more willing to pay something like a hundred times as much. Um, but like humans will do this, but if you tell humans about this and then you ask them the same question, if you tell a thousand people about this problem and then you ask them the question anyway, the answer is still more or less the same. Um, so just knowing about these biases, it's heuristics and biases is the literature that I'm referring to. Uh, and just telling people about this does not fix the problem. People walk away, they finish reading the really interesting, you know, they finish thinking fast and slow by Dan Daniel Kahneman, um, and then they walk away and they're still biased. And there's not much literature about what can you actually do that successfully intervenes and fixes these problems. And that's what CIFAR is trying to do. Um, we are trying to find actual techniques to make people able to think better, to have more accurate beliefs, to have more true beliefs, and also to have more like useful skills and abilities. Um, there's sort of these like, like different sides of rationality. Um, well, so there's, there's epistemic rationality and there's instrumental. And then there's also this sort of third category that is called internal rationality, which is not quite as fundamental. So this, this is sort of a fundamental dichotomy, which is that epistemic rationality is about believing true things about the world. Um, how can I make so the, one of the th metaphors that we have here is this idea of a map versus a territory, um, where there are things out in the world that exist. There is you know, something along the lines of a reality. Um, and I can't directly have knowledge of reality, but I can have beliefs about reality. And so you know, if there's a territory somewhere you know, that has like mountains and trees and rivers, um, I can have a map this is me with my map <laughs> and my map can be better or worse you know it can have rivers where there are rivers and mountains where there are mountains or and that would be like a good map or I could have a bad map that like thought that mountains went down and rivers went up um, and that I mean there are reasons why having a correct map of the territory is more useful than having an incorrect map of the territory and a lot of people actually beyond useful Sorry, this is, I find, like, I think a lot about what is useful. Um, many people just value truth and truth seeking as sort of a terminal goal. And that's what epistemic rationality is all about. Instrumental rationality is like, what is useful? And so that's, so when I said it's, there are reasons why it's useful to have a correct map as opposed to a wrong map, uh, I was thinking in, in terms of instrumental rationality. I was thinking about what are, like, what is it useful to, like, do and feel and believe? And as I was mentioning earlier, like, I came at this from the feeling of wanting to self-improve, wanting to make my, my own thought processes more 
I mean, useful is maybe a correct word for it, but just like sane and helpful and like not destructive. Constructive rather than destructive is maybe a good way of thinking about it. So instrumental rationality and epistemic rationality often agree, right? Because it is useful to have a correct map of the territory, but it's a different approach. And there's some gray area where some people think that there may be times when it's useful to have incorrect beliefs. Um, and this is actually a question that CIFAR gets asked a lot, which is like, oh, but isn't useful to self-deceive sometimes? And in particular, um, we recently ran a workshop for entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs kept saying, um, like, you know, if I have my business, and like 99% of businesses fail, um, and that's like the vast majority of what happens, but it's really hard to like work as hard as you can on a business, if you believe that your business is going to fail, right? So, so they say, wouldn't it be useful for me to believe that I'm going to be like one in a thousand businesses that wildly succeeds, even though the like the evidence against that is relatively strong. The prior that you're going to succeed is way low. Um, so there is like that subset of belief of categories of things where some people would claim it's useful to not have true beliefs. I think that's a great idea. That's not obvious to me that that's the case, but uh, nonetheless, this is only a small fraction of beliefs that people have, where like you could even claim that it's useful to have false beliefs. So mostly epistemic and instrumental rationality get along. Um, internal rationality is sort of a new thing that we've started talking about that is more or less the thing that CIFAR is trying to address, uh, which is like, once you understand how it is that a person should think, what it is that a person should believe, what are the algorithms that you should have for gaining true beliefs and discarding false beliefs. Uh, once you know all of that, how do you actually get it to run? How do you actually get yourself to do it? And that is hard. That is a hard question. Um, you know, there's a lot of people here at CIFAR, at Singinst, um, in the rationality community on Less Wrong, who have spent a lot of time like thinking about this stuff and working on this stuff, but who still find themselves, you know, for example, unmotivated to donate to a high impact charity, even though they like are pretty sure that would be a good idea. That's probably the best use of their money. And they like think that they're utilitarian and they believe that they should be a utilitarian or whatever. Um, and yet when like it comes time to like write a check, they're like, mm, this doesn't feel so good. Um, or like, Sometimes never even get to that point. They're like, oh, but I should do it for, I should not do it for this other reason. So there's all this stuff about actually then like taking all this knowledge and installing it. Like uh, one of our instructors, Critch, likes to refer to it as compiling your program onto your hardware, which is this thing. I mean, another question we get a lot is, so Kahneman talked about, I'm going to draw another awkward looking brain. Um, Kahneman talked a lot about like system one versus system two, where system one is the thinking fast of thinking fast and slow, uh, where when someone says, you know, the word tree, uh, you like hear it in your auditory cortex. So that's not your auditory cortex, your auditory cortex is down here. Um, and then it like, it propagates, right? There's an associations pattern that moves out. So you then, you think about other times you've heard the word tree, and you think the times that you've seen trees, and you think about times that you've touched trees, um, and times when you've like maybe climbed trees as a kid, and all of this different stuff. So there's this like outwards propagation of like different associations, and then those all have associations. And this all happens without like effortful thought on your part, without a conscious decision to do so. It happens whether you want it to or not, and it happens very fast. Anytime, you know, and it happens all the time, right, for the equivalent of every time you hear the word tree. You know, everything that I have just said has been like triggering association networks in your mind of, of related concepts and ideas. So that's the, the system one. And then the system two is like this sort of override process that we have um, that's much that's, that's much more associated with like what it is for us to be human and the fact that we can do abstract reasoning. It's our ability to step back and actually calculate things. And that's the part of us that can, for example, do math and think that a thousand apples is as good, is a thousand times as good as one apple or whatever. 
Um, and a lot of people think that when we talk about um, trying to teach people to be more rational, that we're talking about just system two, that we're going to try and get people to like turn off this part of the, their brain, because this is the part of the brain that has a lot of the biases, um, because the biases are cheaper ways to get close to the correct answer most of the time. So a lot of people think, oh, but like, what about my intuition? Or like, what if I want my intuition? But really what we're trying to do is we're just trying to inform your system one with the things that your system two knows and has figured out, right? So system two is like, oh, like, so one apple is good. And like, you know, lots of apples is like very good. <laughs> it's a silly picture. Um, but system one doesn't know that, and so what CIFAR tries to do is we try to import this knowledge back into system one, so that you can actually have correct intuitions more of the time. Um, and we try to do that fast, and we try to do it across a lot of different areas. Um, because it is true that you can, that like, for example, becoming an expert in a field does this, uh, but it doesn't give you, like, general purpose um, intuition training. And that's what we're trying to do, a part of what we're trying to do. Well, oh, so, you know, first of all, I mean, I went to a mini camp. I went to the first mini camp, actually. Uh, it's, and it's, I mean, the first thing that I think about is how amazing it is the way that we improve each time. Um, and I, I experienced this because I went to the main mini camp and then I saw, how, I've seen how much things have changed here since then. I would say maybe 75% of the content that we taught at the November workshop was different from the main mini camp that I attended um, because we just keep coming up with like better ways to explain things, um, new ideas for units, we're discarding things that don't seem to work well. Um, for example, we teach a two hour long session on Bayes' theorem, um, which is a mathematical theorem that sort of tells you, it doesn't sort of tell you, it does tell you how much you should update on evidence. Um, so if I have a hypothesis about how the world is, and I have a certain amount of confidence in that hypothesis, and then I see something happen in the world that relates to that hypothesis, you know, so for a prototypical example it might be, I believe that there is gravity, um, and then I see an apple float, and that is evidence against my hypothesis of gravity, right? So I should downgrade my confidence in the theory of gravity, and Bayes' theorem tells me exactly how much, based on how likely I am to see an apple float in a world where gravity exists, as opposed to how likely I am to see an apple float in a world where gravity doesn't exist. That's a simplification of, you know, you, there's like lots of parameters that you have to think about, but that's the basic idea. Um, there's like an actually correct amount to update. The tricky part is that we don't actually walk around thinking, oh, I have, you know, 0.9977 confidence in the theory of gravity, uh, because that would be too computationally expensive, we would never get anything done. So the question is, how do you, the question that we try to answer in this session is, how does this theorem inform the way that you should think about everyday life? Um, so, you know, what is strong evidence versus weak evidence? For example, um, you know, like, if I see the apple floating, uh, and then I also pass my hand across it and see that there's not like a line of fishnet attaching it to the ceiling, fishing line attaching it to the ceiling. That makes it stronger evidence. Um, if there is someone who claims to be telekinetic in the room, uh, that is evidence against, or let's see, that makes it weaker evidence, right? Because I think that there's a lot of charlatans in the world who like pretend but have clever tricks and are magicians or whatever. Um, and so the, the presence of, a of someone who claims to be a magician would actually make me think it was weaker evidence because they would be, like, I suspect that they have ways to make an apple look like it's floating, but not actually be violating my hypothesis of gravity. So that's like Bayes' theorem. Um, but so for example, when we first taught that, it was everyone all at the same time, and we had a lot of problems. There was it's, it was one of our less well-rated sessions, um, partly because of the sort of distribution of how comfortable people are with numbers, you know. We bring people to these workshops that are, like, math-phobic, and then we also have people at these workshops who are, like, statistics, PhDs, and, you know, 
have like a proof of basis theorem memorized by heart. So um, trying to teach all those people in one class was very hard. Uh, we tried breaking it into two, that didn't work. Most recently we actually broke, we actually broke it into eight groups so that people were taking this class in groups of two to three and so that the, the classes could be like extremely closely tailored to people's abilities and their interests um, and so that everyone could get their questions answered. We developed packets for the instructors that had about three times as much material, so about enough material for a six hour long class on Bayes' theorem so that ch instructors could adapt and cherry pick the correct examples that were most pertinent to the people they were trying to teach. So that's the sort of thing that we do, right? And that's actually for a session that has existed the whole time. Um, uh, Michael Smith, one of our curriculum developers, teaches a class on what he calls Furoshin, um, which is a term that he gets from his background in Aikido and other martial arts, uh, which is about sort of how to calm your physiological fight or flight response when it's not warranted, uh, which is a really good unit and a lot of people really like it. Didn't even exist in May. Um, because, and we actually have two, it, this is a unit that's really useful in terms of helping people um, to be better at updating. Because if you're in an argument with someone, and I'm like, man, this guy's being a real jerk. And I'm, like, you can see when I'm thinking about this, I'm getting tense, my shoulders are lifting, my fingers are tight, they're hunching forward a little bit, my neck is going down. Uh, when people are, I know when I'm uncomfortable, when I'm having like an SNS, the sympathetic nervous system, which is the part of your nervous system that generates fight or flight response. When I'm in that mode, I rub my neck a lot, um, sort of protecting your neck. People will like fold their arms over. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but I mean, I'm only exaggerating a little bit. Uh, and after, like, after getting to sit on in on his class, I noticed myself when I was stressed out, I would literally end up like doing this in posture um, as opposed to being sort of open. And it turns out that if you actually, one of the things that he teaches in that class is that if you can actually relax and release your physical body posture, it often makes you mentally less stressed, and then you're more able to interact well with whoever it is you're trying to have a conversation with. And often from that, the other person will actually stop being so closed-minded as well, and it just revolutionizes <laughs> the sort of conversations and especially arguments that you can have with people, so that everyone can walk away with more true beliefs and more like useful experiences, as opposed to everyone walking away feeling upset and angry and hurt and defensive. Mm, well, so lots of people actually sort of never, never get around to evaluating evidence from, I mean, it's, not everyone has this problem. I know I have had this problem, and a lot of people do, where when you get upset and defensive feeling, um, I, you actually can't, you sort of can't rationally evaluate the argument that a person is making because you're thinking too much about um, you're sort of knocked down into your like primate brain where it's like, oh, you know, if, if I acknowledge that I'm wrong, like then this person will like think less of me and everyone will, you know, think that I'm like lame and, and terrible and uh, I'll be kicked out of the tribe and I won't be able to eat, you know, right? So it's that sort of like worry and response or um, anger is another side of that. And it causes people to actually be much less able to think about their long-term goals, long-term plans, you know, desire to seek truth, etc. Um, and so many people just like, when they're in that mode, just can't actually evaluate someone else's arguments and they never update on them if they heard them when they were in a, like, in a, in a fight or flight reaction. Um, so the best thing to do is to, is to like, take yourself out of that mode while you're still talking to the person so that you can then actually hear what they're saying listen to it, think about it, respond appropriately, etc. Because, like, we will make, we will help you to become happier, to get more of what you want more cheaply, to figure out what it is that you actually want so that you're not going after things that you didn't really want. Um, and, like, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, we help people figure out what they want, and then we help them figure out how to get it more easily. And, like, what could be better than that? One of the things that I think is one of the most sort of fundamental big picture things that we that we offer people is or that we try to teach is the concept of low hanging fruit. Um, it's, it's which is sort of a 
idiom, which comes from this idea that, you know, there's like a whole tree full of apples, but you should probably just like pick the apple that's right at eye level, um, rather than like being worried that it's going to be a lot of effort to go get the ones that are 40 feet off the ground. Like, no, like just pick the apple that's right here, or at least start with that. And then maybe if you still need more apples, go get the rest of them. Um, and it seems to me that a lot of people sort of think that all the problems that we have are hard problems. Um, we as individuals, we as humanity, um, we as sort of like nations and governments and policy setting, um, and we as like, you know, sisters and friends and, you know, husbands and wives, like in our interpersonal relationships, we sort of think that we're doing it best, the best we can, um, that we're more or less doing everything approximately right and that like doing better would be like hard and difficult and require like lots of thought and effort and energy uh, but it turns out that that's really just not true um, the vast majority of us have like easy and when i say easy i don't just mean like easy in theory but like actually takes a lot of effort um, like that that once you've thought about it for a few minutes it's like obvious that there are ways that you can make huge gains um, and this is what i think of as low-hanging fruit and one of the things we have here at CIFAR is a belief that there is low-hanging fruit, as I just described to you, that like most people have ways that they could, you know, do the equivalent of investing $20 to get $2,000 of value. Um, for example, I recently switched over to wearing barefoot running shoes, um, and I've been sort of thinking I wanted to do this for a while because I like not having thick soles of shoes under my feet. Um, but I really didn't like the sort of stereotypical barefoot running shoes actually have like big awkward toe looking things on them and I really didn't like the way they looked and I was like oh man this is terrible and then someone one day to me said you know they make barefoot running shoes that don't actually have the toe things right I was like what so I went on the internet and I spent 10 minutes looking on the internet and I found these shoes and they've made me extremely happy um, which is you know sort of a trivial example but it was, it was low-hanging fruit. I just like didn't know about this thing. Um, and so the argument is that like most people have things like that in their own life, where if they could see the third alternative or if they could install a certain habit, they could be much, much happier for the investment they make. Um, and then what we're doing is partly collecting many such techniques, many common things that are low-hanging fruit. So for example, one of the things we do in the value of information uh, session, Um, which is one of the units we teach, is we teach people how to use arithmetic to figure out whether they should be willing to um, invest their time in researching something or like finding out more about it. Um, so like a prototypical example might be, okay, maybe I'm flying to England next month and I found a airplane ticket, the first one I found costs $1,500, um, but I, and I'm trying to decide if I should spend 20 more minutes like looking for cheaper fares on various different websites or if I should just go with this one. Um, and I say, okay, well, how much do I think I could save if I found a cheaper fare? Like how much cheaper do I think the fare could be? Maybe $500 cheaper. How likely do I think that is to happen? Maybe 50-50 odds. Um, how much do I value an hour of my time? Maybe I value an hour of my time at $25. Uh, so 50% of $500 means, oh wait, I should be willing to spend perhaps up to 10 hours searching for a cheaper fare. Hmm, maybe I should spend 20 minutes searching for a cheaper fare and see if I can find one, right? Now, it doesn't mean you should spend 10 hours. It just means that you should definitely not spend more than 10 hours. But so one of the VOI calculations we like to have people do in our class is uh, what is the expected value of spending an hour learning how to speed read or learning how to figure out which some people already read very fast. I already read pretty fast. I th the expected value for me of um, spending time speed reading, learning how to speed read is low. But uh, the question of like learning how to pick which parts of a book you should read, um, and people will do something like, okay, so I spend five hours a week reading. Um, how much faster do I think I could get? Maybe I think I could get 10% faster um, at reading. So that would save me you know, half an hour a week. And there's 50 weeks in it. So part of what we teach is how to do like quick mental math. So in quick mental math, there are 
50 weeks in a year, and there are 300, and um, so there are 50 weeks in a year, so that's 25 hours a year. And um, another thing that we talk about is, like, there are many years left in my life. I could guess maybe 60, um, but the value of learning something now sort of goes down year after year, because, like, I don't know, maybe, for example, we'll come up with a way to implant knowledge in people that doesn't require reading, uh, right, and the odds of that go up year after year, or maybe I'll be dead, and the odds of that go up year after year. So, uh, usually the shorthand that I do is I say that this has full value for 20 years, and then after that it won't matter anymore. Um, so times 20 years is, what, 500 hours? What? <laughs> so, if I could get 10% better, if I could need to spend 10% less time reading to get the same information, then that would save me, I think, 500 hours of time. And I do not think it would take me 500 hours to get 10% better at reading, right? I think it might take 5 or 10. So the answer here is that like that's like a, what, 100%, 1000% return on my investment? Oh, and this happens for a lot of people, so we like doing this question. So one of them, as I've mentioned a couple of times, is scope and sensitivity, where uh, getting more of something doesn't seem that many times more good than getting less of something. Um, we like to talk about calibration and confidence, uh, which is about the fact that when I say, when most people say they're 99% sure of something, uh, that that thing does not in fact happen 99 out of 100 times. Uh, and it's actually much more, like, we all sort of know that people don't really mean 99% when they say it, but it's much more extreme than you might think. For example, if you ask students when they're, you know, 50% sure, 75% sure, and 95% sure they're going to be done with, like, a paper that they have to write for a class, uh, it's like, like a quarter are done when they said they'd be 50% when they were 50% sure and like a third are done when they said they were 75% sure and it turns out that like only half, I think less than half are done when they were 95% sure they were going to finish their paper. Um, so that's another, so that type of phenomenon is quite pervasive and something that we try to work on with people. Um, what's another good one? Uh, so there's a lot of good ones that come out of Bayes. Uh, there's something called base rate neglect, where, uh, for example, if you, one of the classic examples of this is if you get a medical test back that comes back positive for some rare disease like breast cancer or AIDS, um, people, and when I say people, I include doctors in this, uh, are tend to think that it's much more likely than it actually is that you have that disease. So like if a woman gets a positive mammogram back, um, for breast cancer, it, the odds are still only about 7% that she has breast cancer. Um, or if someone gets a positive test back for AIDS, the odds are still usually only, you know, the, the first round of tests that they do only increase your odds of having AIDS from, you know, whatever it is, 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 100 or something like that. So it's still really unlikely that you have the disease. Um, the reason for that is that people, um, when they're trying to think about what the odds are given that I have this positive evidence, neglect the like prior improbability of this thing being true and that's something that uh, we I feel like we are pretty good at helping people remember um, and understand or generalizing from one example which is the tendency to think oh so like this is how I would feel or this is how I would react so probably that's what how he would feel or how he is re going to react um, and sort of related to that is the problem of um, where when I do something or feel something or say something, I tend to think a lot about how it's related to my situation. Um, so maybe if I'm like rude to a waiter, I'm like, oh, well, anyone would have been rude to the waiter because like, you know, I like didn't get enough sleep last night and my boss yelled at me this morning and then my, you know, my bus was late and I got to dinner late and you know, so like in that situation, anyone would have been like a little bit short with the waiter when my food came out cold. Um, but when we think about things that happen to other people, uh, so if the waiter was rude to me, 
I would say, wow, that waiter's a really rude person, and I would tend to attribute it to like inherent properties of the other person rather than situational characteristics, because I know all of my own history, right? It, it's, I'm carrying it around with me and I'm thinking about it, but I don't have this other person's situational history. And most people tend to, so they tend to discount situational factors when they're thinking about other people's actions, which is really unfortunate.